Okay, so today is September 30th, 2021, and we are recording this class. So let's just uh, review quickly the third law of motion, right? So here you go. If you have an object uh, subject to the weight, then what does it mean? It means that the urge is attracting the object. What Newton's third law of motion states? The Newton's third law of motion states that if two objects interact with one another, like this apple is interacting with the earth, you know, the force that one object applies to the one, to, to, to the second one, is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction to the force that object number two applies to the number one. So let's say earth is number one, here the apple is number two. Okay, but there are other there are other situations too. Okay, we go in the case of the keyboard, right? Let's see. Here you go, the keyboard. Uh, I'm gonna get the mouse. It's better. So you have you you have to be able to recognize those instances. Okay, so here you go. In the case of the mouse, right? You have the the mouse is pulling here on this. On, on this string, it's like a, a tension. Here, here you go, here, here's the force of the mouse. And my hand is applying an upward force. Those two forces have same magnitude, but opposite direction. There will be all sorts of situations that you have to identify this case, okay? Here you go, a string under tension, you know, like the horizontal, true. I can attach. I can attach two objects to this string, right? The mouse and pull it. So I can have a. Let me see if I have a, a, a nice string here. Mm -hmm. Well, let's use this one. Okay, let's continue using this one. So here you go. I have my right hand and I have my left hand. My left hand is applying a force to my right on this string. The string is under tension. And my left hand is applying a force to the left. Okay, so let's say my right hand is object one. My right hand is object one. My left hand is object number two. So that's another example. There are all sorts of examples. Here you go, earth and moon. The earth attract the moon. That's the force. That's the force that the earth exerts on the moon. Okay, so the moon also attracts the earth and that's the force that the moon exerts on the earth okay rocket the case of the rocket okay the case of the rocket is a little bit uh, it is the same principle looks different but it's the same principle so what's going on here you know the case of the rocket the engine is applying a force in the gases that are being expelled from the rocket Okay, the engine that's here inside the rocket. But the gases, because they're feeling this force downwards, they are going to react and pull and push the rocket upwards. Okay? That's another example. That's another example. Let's see. Here you go. In the case of... Let's see this one. Is what I, oh, yeah. Here you go. The case of an object resting over the surface here of the table. Right? It's the same thing as before. The weight, this object has a weight, and the earth is attracting the earth is attracting this object towards the center of the earth, but the object is also attracting the earth. Okay, this vector here states that this force is being applied at the center of the earth. There are all sorts. Okay, and then there is this other situation as well. Don't remember the normal force that the object is subjected to? The, this is a force that the surface is applying on the object. So the surface is interacting with my block. So if, if there is a normal force preventing the object from falling down to going towards the center of the earth, it means that the object is also exerting a normal force in the opposite direction with the same magnitude. Okay? So those, those, here we have one pair of action and reaction. Here we have another pair of action and reaction. So you will need to 
I identify those things. Oh, here you go. Here is one, one problem that we are going to solve. Okay? We have two blocks. Go ahead, write it down. All right? We have two blocks here. Block one and block two. They are in contact with one another. Okay? And what's going on here? Okay, block number one is going to apply a force on block number two to the right. Okay, so here you go. That's uh, what we call the action force, right? But block number two is going to react against that force that block number one is applying. Here's the force of one in two. Here's the force of two in one. Okay. So that's the pair. And we can solve a problem. We can solve this problem here by using what we call free body diagram. Let's try this one. Okay, here you go. I believe I have there in my notes. Yeah, let's take a look here. Here you go. Formulation of the problem. Two blocks of mass M1 and M2 sit over a frictionless surface and are in contact with one another. A force F, you know, doesn't matter where this force comes from, can be my hand, my hand propelling those two blocks. Right? So be, should be something like that. What we have in there it can be something like that. Here you go. These two blocks. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to put the other side. The smaller block, larger block. M1 and M2. And then I apply a force here okay, on the back of this guy. Okay? That's what we have in there. So, those two blocks are in contact with one another. So this block is applying a force on this other block to the to my left. You're right. Yeah? And this block is applying a force on this one to the to my right, which is your left. Okay? You cannot see this force, it's an invisible force. But you have to imagine that. Right? Doing this type of drawings. Okay, you have to know that they are interacting with one another. Okay. If I were to apply a force not here, but I would apply the same force here, there would be no interaction, right? So the force must be applied in the proper way. To have an interaction, you have to apply the force here. If you apply the force here, then there is no interaction, right? Because they lose contact. There's a loss of contact. But if you apply here, then there is an interaction. Okay, so here you go. Try, try to do that. What is the acceleration of both blocks? That's the first question. That's the easiest of all. You can apply Newton's second law in this problem. Okay? You can apply Newton's second law in this problem. So try to solve this one right in here. And so because we have two objects, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to solve this problem. Okay? So what I'm going to do here... And here you already have a, here you go, here you already have a, a hint how to solve this problem, okay? I'm going to, here you go, I'm going to erase that, that's the hint here, okay? And what's the scene? Acceleration. So now... What am I doing here in item A? In item A, I'm considering the two blocks that go to be the single block. Okay? And if I keep on applying the same force on this set, we are going to accelerate. Assume that there is no friction. Assume there is no friction, right? So here we go. Uh, friction on the surface. So this one, this first item A should be easy to, to solve. Okay, try to solve that by using what we call free body diagram, okay? I'm going to show you the free body diagram. That's the free body diagram right in here. I am considering those two blocks as though as they behave as a single one. And as behave as a single one, I mean their net mass is going to be M1 plus M2. Can you do that?
you do not oops, you do not have to use Newton's third law in this case. In this case, you do not have to use Newton's third law. Or you can if you want if you want to, but uh, I'm gonna give you a result that uh, Let's identify Hegel. Non-force that's applied to the object, we have this mass and mass and force. Okay, and we have this little interface here. Let's look at every force that's applied to this guy. Okay, here you go. You have the weight of one, you have the weight of the weight of two, the weight of one. Okay? You have the normal of one, the normal of two. Okay. This object cannot, oh, don't forget to put the arrow there at the top. The object is not in the put the X, the X and Y axis as well. This object is not moving along the y axis. Okay, the object is not moving along the y axis. Consequently, the forces, the net force along the y axis is going to be zero, right? What does it mean? It means that, vectorially speaking, W1 plus N1 plus W2 plus N2 is equal to zero. And I'm taking those two objects as though as they are my whole system. Okay? In physics, you can do that. You can consider two objects as being a single one. Okay? It's possible to do that in physics. Let me see if I have it. No, I don't have it. I'll have to add this, this slide. Let me add this slide here. Okay, so here we go. Let's do like that. Here you go. And I'm gonna I'm gonna erase this slide right now. Okay. And then what I no that will leave it there. Okay. So what I'm doing here, I'm doing the following. I'm considering the two blocks as those they are a single one. That's what this drawing is all about. Usually denote that by a box, you know, like this one. Okay. okay. A box like that that uh, surround the whole object, the whole system. We don't call it object; we call it a system. I'm going to put this guy outside. Like I said, you can, that you, this force is already given, right? You, you can identify the other forces that are being applied to this object. 
we can identify the weight of 1 plus the weight of 2. I'm going to do like that. Since I have uh, considered that as being a single object, we go. down weight of 1 plus weight of 2. Right. And then you can go the next step and consider another force too, the normal, right? It's going to have the same length as the weight, as the sum of the weight. But just like I told you, since the object is not accelerated along the y-axis, that means that this weight cancel out with the with the normal and one plus m two. Okay. So strictly speaking. the only force acting in this object is going to be the horizontal force F. No friction. There's no friction whatsoever. Go first, right? Next one. And now we are ready to solve, solve the problem. Thirtieth twenty one. Mm -hmm. I get one of the equations here. Eight. We go net force. I'll use this one here as the net force. to F and then it go M1 plus M2. Mm 
brackets and one equal times the acceleration. Okay, that's what uh, the acceleration is in the x direction. Now you solve it. So for the acceleration, right? Here you go. A. Let's put that here. Oh, don't forget F net is equal to what? That force F. Uh, and then uh, here you go. Let me also put this like that. Here you go. That's Newton's law, right? And it happens that F net turns out to be equal to F. That's the best way of... First you formulate the law. Then you identify each of the elements of the formula. There is only one force that that doesn't cancel out there, and that's the horizontal force. And now we solve for the mass, for the mass, not for the acceleration. Okay, that's the acceleration. And let's go to the next whatever what he asks next one. What's the force that block one exerts on block two? Okay. And part of the answer is already in there. And this is slide here. Here we go. That's, here you go, that's the force that block 1 exerts on block 2. We do not know its value. We do know M1, we do know M2, we do not know, we do know A because we just calculate A. We know F, but F1 and 2 we do not know, right? Here's the force of contact between 1 and 2. So now we are going to consider just block number 2 as though it is our system. So that's the idea of systems in physics. Okay? And we're going to apply Newton's second law. Do you see the force F touching block number two? Is it touching block number two? Force F? No, right? So you do not account for this force F. You account only for the force that block one is, at, is applying to block number two. Okay? So... How many forces do you have in the horizontal direction applied to block number two? According to this drawing? Huh? How many forces do you have in the horizontal direction? Huh? Twelve forces, you said? Huh? How many forces, right? Twelve is the subscript, right? It's not the number of forces. Okay, do you see another force to the left here? No, right? It's just uh, this mass is applying a force to the right. Nothing else. So there is only one force. There is only one horizontal force being applied to block number two. Okay? That's not obvious. But uh, remember, I'm considering this guy as though as it is my system. We still have that force, that reaction force being applied to the left. We still have that. But this force, the reaction force, is applied to one. It's not applied to two. Okay? And we are taking only the forces applied to two. Okay? So much that I put it as though the number one is a ghost. Right? It's a little bit fainted here. See that? And the number two is, is strong. So we go ahead and write our equations again. Here you go. Not this one. This one right in here. B. Okay. I'm going to do it like that. Here you go.
be f net is equal to ma again right so here you go so now i want to know the force apply it to two which i call force of one apply it to two one two all right and the mass is going to be just the mass of the second object because that's our because that is our system do you see that the acceleration i found it previously so i can plug it here we go I'll plug it here we go All right and now i found what f was the value of the force that block number one applied to block number two Go. That's what it is. I'm gonna do it even in a better way. I'm gonna put this F here on the right side, and I'm gonna put this M2 here in the ratio. Okay. Now you tell me this F12 is equal to F less than f or greater than f take a look at this mathematical result take a look at this mathematical result i'm not even gonna put the parentheses there i'm gonna take out the parentheses we don't need the parentheses right we don't need the parentheses we don't need the parentheses so the question that i make um how f12 compares with f is it equal greater or smaller according to this equation here no one possible answer we go compare to f how F12 compares to F. Subscript, here we go. Is this number here 1 greater than 1 or less than 1? I can hear. Okay, is is m2 divided by m2 if you are m2 divided by m2 it's gonna be one right but no it's not one because it will have another term here we are summing so this denominator here is greater than the numerator okay so if m2 is gonna be one kilogram and let's see which one is the bigger block let's see which one is the bigger block so i can the M, uh, the M2, right? So if M2, oh, if M2 is one, M2 is two kilograms, for instance, right? And M1 is one kilogram, right? One plus three, one, one plus two, right? This number is going to end up being what? This ratio is going to be end up being what? Two thirds. Less than one, right? Because this ratio here is less than one, my F12 is going to be less than F. Do you follow? Okay. Here you go. So we go ahead and you look at the math, right? Okay, the, uh, the ratio, you go, M2 divided by M1 plus M2. It's less than one. Consequently, F12 is a number less than one. F12 is equal to what? 
is equal to a number that is less than one. So let's say less than one is going to be 0 0.5, right? Let's say. No, not 0 0.5. It's two thirds, sorry. Two thirds, right? So F12 is going to be less than F. Okay? Is 66% of F. What does it imply? It implies that F12 is less than F. Okay? So what's happening here? What's happening here? When we have a situation like that, the force F, you know, is carrying a little bit of force here in M1 and a little bit of force here in M2. That's what's happening. This force is being spread out among those two blocks. That's what's happening. Okay? It is as though, as though as this force is being spread out among those two blocks. Okay, so that we got uh, the item B. And then item C. Now I want to know what's the force that blocks two exert on one. Assume that you do not know the result in item B. Okay. If you knew the result in item B, you know, you already knew what was going to be the value of the force of block, uh, block two exert on one, right? Here you go. Let's go ahead, back here. Here you go. That's the force that block two exerts in block one. Right in here. Is a action-reaction pair. So the magnitude should be what? The magnitude of this one compared to the magnitude of this one should be what? Okay. Equal. Okay? That's assuming that you knew F1 applied it to 2. That's assuming. If you do not know, then you do the same mass. Then you do the same mass. Right? And the mass that you do, here you go. You use your free body diagram. You zoom in in the first mass identify the forces that are being applied to the first mass and solve for Newton's second law. Okay? So, the horizontal force that we have is F and F of 2 in 1. That's all. Okay, so let's go. C. C. Okay. There you go. F net. I'm going to use this one here. F net in one, right? I'm going to put it like that. F net in one. And I'm going to be even better here. I'm going to put here in the other one. F net in two. I'm going to emphasize that the net force applied to two. In the other one, it's going to be the F net applied to both blocks. One, two. Okay? That's why I have M1 plus M2 here. Right? Can you picture that? Notation sometimes make a big difference, okay? Notation sometimes make a big, big difference. Because it's just the block number one, so the mass will end up being M1. And the net force in one is going to be what? Look at the drawing. Is F to the right, right? And F12 to the left. F21 to the left, not F12, but F, F to the right, F21 to the left. So here you go, going back here is 21. Because my system is mass 1, so we keep mass 1 here. I'm going to correct that, right? I already know what this acceleration is, so I substitute for the acceleration. And I want to know this guy here. But you already know it's going to be, it's supposed to be equal to F12, right? Let's see if it's equal to F12. Let's see. So for F21. I'm going to 
pass this F to the other side. Like that. I'm going to multiply by minus 1. Left and right side. Okay. And I'm going to commute those two. Let's see if we can simplify, simplify more. Okay. I'm going to go. You might be able to simplify. I'm going to put this S and M2 right in here in a common numerator, right? And a common denominator. So now, when I do that, we are going to end up with a S M1 plus M2 factor. This term cancels out with this term, right? You see that? I'm going to combine F F. This term cancel out with this term, and we are left with uh, let's see if you know, yeah, and two F. Here. Let's see, let's compare. You already know that this F of Q1, according to Newton's third law, is supposed to be the same compared to F12, right? Let's see if you get it. Okay. The magnitude, yep. Remember, we're doing here only the magnitude here. When we set up this equation here, we assume that F21 was positive. Okay, even though it's to the left, we assume that F21 was positive. So, so this F21 here was a magnitude. That's why I put the negative sign here. So that's uh, Newton's third law of motion. Apply it to this problem. Okay, any questions? Okay, so <laughs> any questions? Try to do this problem again, there at home. You know, it doesn't get it right away. It doesn't get it, you know, we don't, we don't always get it right away. We gotta practice several times until, we, you know, we pick to have a, a clear picture. So this one, let's see if I have another example here for you. It's 538. Yeah, let's have our break. Let me take attendance and then I'm going to solve more examples. Here you go. Oh, everything spelled out here in my notes. Okay.
and we have this one in the book as well. This is an example of Newton's first law of motion. Because the object is static. Okay, and then I'm gonna look at the friction, okay? So let's uh, take our, a little, our little break first, but let me take attendance. Let's take attendance and then we have our break. Daniel Abraham. Nope. Next, Mario Acevedo. Yes. Okay. Harun Atif. Musa Atif. Genesis Bell. Jennifer Camarillo. Okay. Vincent Daluizio. Robert Faust. Yeah. Pedro Flores. Lawrence Flores. Yeah. Alexander Garcia. Sung Ham. Brian Herrera. Nope. Brian Inez. Astina, no. Jesus Lep, Cassandra Martinez, Dylan Martinez, Henry Martinez, Leonardo Melgar, okay. uh, Rafael Mercado, Raymond Miramontes, Jaime Mondragon, Alexis Negret, Yahia Parises, no. Marco Antonio Partida, yeah. Armando Perez, good. Abraham Perez, no. Nope. Nicolas Pisano, here. Good. Hans Busker, Hans, not here. Ramon Quintana, Albert Ramirez, Ali Sarabi, okay. Amna Sieda, no, nope. she dropped. David Sompatli. Not here, Dave. He's from Paxley, right? Antonio Vega. Kenneth Villa Gomez. Patrick Villavazov. No. Nolan Williams. Okay, 30 students. It's 541 right now. So let's go for. 15 minutes break 556. Okay, see you shortly. Remind me, uh, Armando, mm -hmm. remind me to turn it on. Okay, I'm gonna pause it, I'm gonna pause the recording. Remind, remind. So, let's do this problem here. You know the mass, you know the angle of the plane. You know the mass of the object, you know the angle of inclination of the plane. Doesn't have to be, I'm gonna put genetic here. Doesn't have to be necessarily 20 degrees. It's a frictionless surface. surface the idea here find the acceleration okay find the acceleration So let's see here. Another example, here you go. Mass M in, a, in an inclined, on, a, on an inclined plane, right? On an inclined plane. 
of angle theta. Find the acceleration oh, on an inclined frictionless uh, inclined plane of angle theta. Uh, mass m sitting on a frictionless surface. Sitting on a frictionless surface. Which is inclined at an angle theta. Find the acceleration. It is similar to that problem that we did in the lab, right? The only difference here is that we are we are we're gonna find out the acceleration using arguments of forces. What we did there in the lab was also uh, frictionless surface, but we just what we did in the lab is just decompose the acceleration of gravity. Okay, and whatever acceleration we get using arguments of force should be the same acceleration that we got there upstairs. You know, according to the angle. So let's see, here you go. What we have to do again? We have to identify the forces. Okay, that's the mass that we want to find out the force. It's just one object problem, okay? Because it's one object problem, you don't have to worry about Newton's third law. So you gotta worry, you gotta worry about the forces. So what are the forces? First, we have the weight. First, you have the weight. Which other force do you have there? I can hear you. The normal. Yep. Here we have the normal now. Frictionless surface, we don't have to worry about that. So what's next that we have to worry? There is no more, no other forces, right? Just the weight and the normal. So we have next thing that we have to worry. I can erase this one here. Next, next thing that we have to worry is our x and y axis. Okay. Well, we have all sorts of choices here. We can make the, the most obvious axis it would be the one that has that is horizontal here with this surface. We can solve this problem with this x and y axis. It's possible to solve this problem. But it's, it's far, it makes for a much simpler solution if you choose this axis here instead. Okay? Makes up for a much simpler solution if you choose an axis that x-axis that's parallel to the inclined plane and you can do that x parallel to the inclined plane and y is normal to the inclined plane okay and then what's next we are going to break down the forces with respect to the axis with respect to our axis. Our fancy axis that has this inclination. You, what, what you have to keep in mind is that, you know, you can choose uh, whatever axis you want, okay? Physics is flexible about the axis that you choose, provided, you know, it's, uh, you can solve the problem. Okay, so, the force, oh, what's going to happen to this object? It's going to slide down the plane, right? There's no friction. It starts at the initial velocity zero. So what's going to power the object down the, down the plane? It's going to be this x component of the weight. This component of the weight is the one that's going to be powering the object down, down the plane. Can you picture that? Okay. So let's see the other one. And then the, the key now is to figure out what is this x component of 
of the value of this x component of the weight. Okay? Right in here. This guy, what's the value? Okay, you have to study the angles here in this problem, okay? We have a triangle right here, see that? You know that this angle right in here is theta. Okay, and in addition to this triangle here, you have this other triangle here. Okay. That's the triangle that's going to give you the x component of your weight. That's the triangle that's going to provide you. But then you're going to need this triangle here to figure out what are the angles that we are talking about in this smaller triangle. Okay. So you know that this angle is theta. You know that this angle here in the red triangle is 90 degrees. What's going to be this angle right in here? What's going to be this angle right in here? Yeah, 90 minus theta. If this one is 90 minus theta, what's going to be this angle right in here, in this smaller triangle? See, it's parallel, right? What's going to be this angle right in here in the other triangle? Huh? The same, right? This angle here is the same as this angle here, right? Because this side here is parallel to this side. And this red side here is also parallel to the black one. Okay, so here we go. Let me see if I already put in there. Okay, because this angle here is 90 minus theta, this angle here is going to be what? Remember, it's a triangle. It's going to be what? Here we go. This one is 90 minus theta. This one is theta. This one is 90. Then this one is 90 minus theta, you told me, right? This one is 90, and this one is going to be what? Theta. theta. Okay. That's what, oh, that's what you have in the next slide. Right in here, in the next slide. Let me erase everything here. I was using this slide for something else. For a different problem. So we go. And then I erase this one as well. And now I place, yep. So that's, so because this one is theta, let's go to the next one. Oh, oh man, I missed that. I'm not going to put everything. Okay, so here we go. This one is here. Go. And now we know what's the value of Wx. Right? Wx that's powering the object along this surface is going to be y, or y, w, weight, mg, sine of theta, right? Make sense? Mg sine of theta. So that's the only force that's propelling this block downwards. So let's go right, right ahead and write down our equations. Okay, net force is equal to ma. Oops. Okay. Let's not forget. The net force becomes W sub X. W sub X, MA, and W sub X is what? MG, sine of theta.
we go. And that's the equation that we want to solve. So I'm going to place it right in here. What happens to the mass? The mass cancels out, right? I'm going to put it in the next line. Mass cancels out with mass. And this key. Kind of theta. That's the acceleration that we got. That we get. Okay. So we can put uh, a a sign. Uh, we can put a, a arrow for the acceleration. He go like this one here. That's what we usually do in those problems. We indicate the acceleration of the object as being a it's supposed to be a the acceleration is actually negative because it's against the x-axis. Yeah, we don't need that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't need that. We don't need that. Yep. We don't need this one. We don't need this one. Okay. And now let's do that. The other problem. The other problem that is supposed to be simpler because it involves only, only the Newton's first law. Okay, so three different problems, right? One that involves the third law, the third law and the, first, and the second law. This one involves only the second law. And the next one involves just the first law, like this one. That's in the book, by the way. Okay, our object of weight W hangs from a, ta a cable tied to the other two cables. That's the figure here. The upper cable makes two different angles with the horizontal. The upper cables, yeah, make two different angles with the horizontal. Theta 2 and th theta 1 and theta 2. The tension in the upper cables, those two cables here, ex uh, cannot exceed T maximum. Okay, this is a real life problem. Okay, if you're an engineer, want to hang up, hang up a, a uh, traffic light like that, you have to worry about, you have to worry if your cable are going to tolerate this, the, the tension that's going to be imposed on the cables. Okay, and if you go to the hardware store you can buy cables that are rated according to their to their tension okay you go to the hardware store and say what was the tension rated of tension rate of this cable right and the salesman is gonna tell you X okay so here you go what must be the maximum value of the weight so the cables do not break that's the idea again you go ahead and you do the free body diagram Okay, so what's happening here? You have this weight here that's known. You know the angles, and this traffic light is is putting a tension in this in this cable. We want to know whether this the tension is going to exceed those two. Okay, this this cable here is strong enough. The question is whether those two are going to be able to withstand the tension. Okay, so we go ahead and use this point here as your, your, your system. 
there's a tension, a, a downward tension applied to that point, there's a tension to the left, there's a tension to the right. And this point is at rest. Okay, and we are going to find out what's going to be the values of tension 1 and tension 2 and see if it exceeds this value here at max. Okay, first law. So let's see, I have the solutions here. I'm not going to type it from scratch. Here you go. The cable, you know, the weight of this traffic light is transferred to this cable here because the cable is supposed to be weightless. Negligible mass, not weightless, but negligible mass. Okay, so the force going downward is going to be the weight. Then you have this tension 1 and this tension 2. Because this point here is at rest, the net force applied to it must be zero. Okay, we know W, we do not know T1, we do not know T2, but we do know theta 1 and theta 2. And we also know that T1 and T2 cannot exceed T max. So here you go. Net force along the x-axis is zero. Okay, you can put your axis like that in the horizontal. Net force along the y-axis is zero too. Because the point is at rest. Okay, let's break down. The net force is going to be T2 cosine, cosine theta 2. Let's see here. That's theta 2, right? That's theta 2, and that's going to be theta 2 as well. Okay, this angle here is going to be theta 2. So the x component is T2 cosine theta 2. To the right is positive, to the left is negative. That's why I put the negative sign here. T1 cosine theta 1. Theta 1 here, theta 1 here. Theta 1 here, theta 1 here. That's the x component of the force, of the net force. Then you have to do the y component of the net force. Remember, here you go, what do we have? Let's take a look. Don't go to the second equation yet. Just, let's just look at it and analyze. Right? Don't, uh, you know, don't do like I, us I used to do. You know, I, I was so anxious about solving a problem. I would just write, keep on writing down equations, trying to solve the problem by writing down, writing down the equations. Right? But, but no, you got to stop, look at the equation. That's what's called discipline, right? And think about it. What do we have? We have one equation with two unknowns, T1 and T2. Okay? That's what we have. Can we solve this system alone with this equation alone? Can we solve this equation with, you know, can we solve for T1 and T2 with this equation alone? One equation for two unknowns. Yes or no? You know theta 1, you, know, you know theta 2. Huh? If you have two unknowns, how many equations are you going to need? You're going to need two. But you have only one here, right? we got to get a second one. The second one is the, y, uh, the one that goes in the y-axis. Okay? The components of T1 and T2 in the vertical is going to be multiply, multiplied by sine of their angles, respective angles. Okay? So this guy here, vertical of T1 is T1 sine of theta 1. Vertical of T2 is T2 sine of theta 2. They are, but now they are summing because they are along the y-axis. They are subtracting whenever they are along the x-axis. What is subtracting them? What is subtracting them is the weight. And now we have two equations and two unknowns. We have, we know this guy, we know this one, we know this one. What we do not know is T1 and T2. That's the key of solving a problem, mathematical problem. That's the key of solving a problem in physics. You have to make sure you have enough equations to solve your problem. You have to identify the unknowns. And you have to make sure you're going to get enough equations to solve for your unknowns, okay? The other problem, so what's next? Okay, here we go. Now we're going to go about solving this problem. Okay, so let's. Uh, the easiest way to solve this problem is by using up this equation here. We have only two terms. So let's use up that. And uh, let's solve for T2 in terms of T1. 
Every time that we solve for T2 in terms of one unknown in terms of the other one, we are, we are eliminating the first unknown. That's what you're doing. Okay, so here you go, T2. Okay, uh, I, I'm also passing the W to the other side. Here you go, now T2 in terms of T1. And I can go ahead and substitute that in the second equation. Right in here. See the sine of theta 2 here? That's sine of theta 2 as well. So that's my T2. And now we have one equation for one single anon T1. Okay? So I'm just going to repeat the first equation. The one that will eliminate the, the unknown. I'm going to work out a little bit better the second equation. So sine divided by cosine is tangent. In this case, it's theta 2. And I'm going to solve for T1, put T1 in evidence. That's what I did here. And that's what we get for T1. Okay, that's what we get for T1, and then we feed T1 right in here for, T, for the equation for T2. Okay, did I do that? Yes, I did that. Okay. Can I simplify that further? Yeah, if you want to, yeah. What can I do to simplify that further? I can pass this cosine of theta 1 to below this denominator here. Let me see if I did that. Yeah, I didn't do it. But uh, anyway, this cosine theta 1 cancels out with, with this theta 1. And we are left only with the theta 2. This cosine theta 1 combines with the sine of theta 1 and becomes tangent of theta 1. And we are left with the cosine of theta 2. Oh, don't forget, this one is a separate one. This cosine theta 2 is multiplying right those two guys let's can we simplify that further yes i think so so let's see okay this tangent is sine divided by cosine theta 2 so this co the cosine of this first of this first tangent is going to cancel out with this one okay and that's why you have the sine of theta 2 here and the second term Okay, so that's our final result for T1 and T2. I cannot simplify that anymore for T1, right? And in order for that not to exceed T max, and T max is a known value, all we have to do is to make sure that this ratio here for theta 1 is less than t max and this ratio for t2 is less than t max as well so if you have numerical values you could do that you could find that out okay another way of putting that is that the weight must be less than that so it depends on the angle it depends on the angle okay the shallower the angle is the easier it is for you to withstand the tension. Okay. So the book did a numerical solution for that. Okay, so here we go. According to our previous drawing, let's see. Oh yeah, now then you can, you know, then you can figure out what uh, which one is going to be. Let's see what I did here. I'm trying to remember what I did here. Okay. The question is, which tension is greater? Is T1 greater than T2 or T2 greater than T1? That's the question that I, I'm making here. And I, I'm analyzing this, this, uh, this equation. Okay. So I wrote that down. Let's see. Theta 1. Yeah, cosine T max. W must be less or equal to max cosine theta 1. Where does cosine theta 1 come from? Mm. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, this cosine theta one passed to the other side. Yeah, okay, good. And where this cosine, this other cosine comes from? <laughs> yeah, there must be a, I think that there is a mistake here. I don't think we have a cosine theta one here. Unless I made another simplification. Yeah, 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 we're not supposed to have a cosine theta one here, right? We're not supposed to have this cosine theta one. Because, yeah, see, W must be less or equal T max cosine theta 1 tangent theta 2 sine theta 1. This, there's, you know, we, we are not supposed to have this cosine theta 1 here. I gotta fix that. I have to fix that. And here too, we're not supposed to have this cosine theta 2 either, right? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, yes, okay, okay, yeah, that's okay. We can have that. What I did, you know, what I did here was the following. I put the cosine theta 1 in evidence. So it's it's okay. It's okay to do what I did. Okay? It's okay to do what I did. I put the cosine theta 1 in evidence here. See that? The parentheses. I forgot to close this parentheses here. This parentheses is supposed to close here. This parentheses too is supposed to close here. Okay? So this close in parentheses is supposed to be here. This close in parentheses is supposed to be here. Okay? So it's just a question of which one is going to be the greater one, you know, which term is going to be the greatest one, right? So because theta 1 is less than theta 2, see, the, this term is exactly the same term as this one, you know, it's the greater one is going to be this one right in here. And miracle sign is a decreasing function, right? Cosine is a decreasing function. So that's what we have for that. What time is that? 6.30. Any questions about that? Perhaps see that at home, okay? Those things don't come naturally. We have to keep on solving those things over and over again to get it, uh, to really understand it. Let's see. And now we can start talking about the force of friction. We should have uh, 20 minutes to go. A little bit more than 20 minutes. Okay, so let's talk about the force of friction. I'm going to write down the other one. Here. types of force, two types force of static friction and force of kinetic friction. Remember that. And they behave differently. And they behave differently. Although their equations are somewhat similar. Okay, let's start with the force of the static friction, okay? Let's take a look at this object here. You know, I've ever tried to move an object, you apply a force to it and it's difficult to get it going. Right? See, I'm applying a force to this bottle, it's not moving yet. I have to reach a certain value to make it move. Okay, here we go. We can, oh man, this guy is, okay, finally. See that? I'm applying a force, applying a force, applying a force, applying a force, oh, okay, finally. I'm increasing the force little by little, little by little. Okay. So the moment that the object starts, while the object is at rest, you know, apply a force. So we have a force of friction that, is the, that we call the force of static friction. Let me put that there. Right? No, no, let's keep it here. 
Make sense? While the object at rest, the force of friction that we have is the force of static friction. When the object starts moving, then it becomes a force of kinetic friction. And those two forces behave differently. Okay, somewhat different. Okay, here you go. The force of here you go. The force of static friction. You know, occurs for object at rest. It is possible to apply a force and not get the object to move because of the force of static friction. Okay. To break off from this force, you must apply a minimum to break off, to, to, let me see, to get an object, to get an object to move. while it is at rest and subjected to the force of the static friction, comma, you must apply a minimum force break off to, to make the object move. Okay? Just like my bag here too, right? Here you go. I'm applying. I'm gonna apply a force. Apply a force. Apply a force, and then finally, I made it move. That's how uh, the force of friction behaves. So, so what does it tell us? It tells us that the force of friction has a maximum value. It tells us that the force of static friction can vary from zero to a maximum value. That's what this is telling us. Okay. This tell us that the force of static friction varies from zero to a maximum value. That's how it is. I'm going to tell you what this maximum value is. I'm going to show you here in the drawing. Here we go. This one right in here. Yeah. So if you, if you are going to plot, you know, an applied force versus the force of uh, the static friction, what do I slide show here? Some current slide. You have some, you know, you know, axis, applied force. Here you go. My applied force and the force of of friction. What's gonna happen? You know, while you apply this force, the object doesn't move and the force of friction keep on increasing. This is the force of static friction. Let me see here. Within this interval, the velocity of the object is zero. Okay? It's zero. It's really zero. It's not even moving its constant velocity. It's just at rest with respect to the surface. Then it reaches a maximum value. This maximum value is the force of maximum value of the force of static friction. So this force of the static friction can have several values depending on the applied force. I'm applying one newton right now. Force of the static friction is one newton. I'm applying two newtons right now. Force of the static friction is two newtons. See the object at rest. So net force has to be zero, right? It comes from Newton's second law. I'm applying three newtons now. The object is still at rest. Force of the static friction is also three, three newtons. And then if I come to reach a maximum value, then the object start moving. Okay? Can you picture that? And there is an equation for this guy here. I'm going to show you soon. There's an equation for this guy. Once you break off from this point, something, the object start moving and something else happens. What takes over is the force of kinetic friction. And the force of kinetic friction is usually, not all the time, less than the maximum value of the force of static friction, usually. 
Okay, do you see that here? It's usually. Um, okay, if I drop my applied force to the value of the force of kinetic friction, then the object starts moving with constant velocity. If I keep, in, keep on applying this force right in here of maximum value for the static friction, then the object is going to accelerate because the force of kinetic friction is less than the applied force, okay? That's what you have to memorize. Let me see if I have another one here. No. 634. Did you get the idea? Now we can start talking about the maximum value of the force of static friction and the value of the force of kinetic friction. Okay, here you go. Here you go. Now I gotta talk about that. Yeah? The force of kinetic friction is the force of friction that appears whenever an object is moving. Whether it's accelerated or moving from whether whether it is accelerated or not. Accelerated or not. Okay? Again, force of static friction is exactly what the name says. Force of static friction is the force of friction that appears whenever an object is at rest. Is at rest. Here you go. Force of kinetic friction, okay. Now, the force of a static friction has a range of values that depends on the external force that is applied to the object. Okay? Just like that graph you saw. Right in here. At this point in time, you know, the force the applied force was zero. So the force of static friction is zero too. At this point here, maybe it's 10 newtons. The force of static friction is also 10 newtons, but the object is not moving. At this point here, maybe it's 30 newtons, the applied force, and the force of static friction is also going to be 30, 30 newtons. Then it comes to a point that the applied force is just above this maximum value of the force of static friction and the object starts to move. Okay? And let's see what's going to be the equation for that. This maximum value. Okay. Uh, force of static friction. I put like that. Six thirty-seven. Almost there, right? Here you go. Is an inequality, right? The force of static friction can have a value anywhere between zero. Where is it? This one here. Anywhere between zero and a maximum value that I call maximum va value of static friction. Okay. Now, the question is, what is this maximum value of the static friction, okay? Okay, the value of this maximum force of the static friction is going to depend on the surfaces. Okay? It's going to depend on the surface of my bag, the first surface of the object, and the surface that the object is in, in contact with. Okay? And... Oops. Not what I want. Okay, so, and it is given by something that we call the coefficient of the static friction.
the coefficient of static friction. But it's not just that. It's not just that. It's not just the coefficient of static friction. It's the coefficient of static friction times something else. Times the normal that can apply that's applied to the object. Okay? Can you picture that? Right now, the normal of this object is equal to its weight. Right now, the normal of this object, again, is equal to its weight. But if I press against it, the normal is going to increase. The weight is not going to increase, but the normal is going to increase. Make sense? Consequently, the maximum force of static friction is going to increase as well. Because this coefficient here didn't change. Like I said, this coefficient depends on the surfaces. Okay? On the nature of the two surfaces that are in contact. Can you keep can you picture that? Okay? The higher the normal, the more the force of static friction. If again, if I apply a force here, the static the the force of the normal is going to increase and the maximum value of force of static friction is going to increase. Similarly, if I apply an upward force to this object and not doesn't manage to raise it, the normal is going to decrease. Can you picture that? The normal is going to decrease if I try to raise it. And the, the maximum value of the force of the static friction is going to decrease. Okay? So here you go. Let's, let's write that down here. You know. If I apply a downward force to an object, the normal, its normal force, normal force is going to increase. Increase. Similarly, similarly, if I apply an upward force to an object, its normal force is going to decrease. But is it which implies, which implies that the, that F sub X max, that F sub X max also increases, also increases. Okay, if I apply to decrease, comma, which implies that also decreases, it's all there in the equations, decreases, right? Now, again, this thing here is going to depend on the surfaces, okay? And it has no unit, uh, mu sub s, mu sub s, is called the coefficient of the static friction and depends on the surfaces in question, surface of the object object in contact with the surface it rests upon, okay? And, and what about, uh, so here you go, so we can here write this relationship here, this inequation, right? We can here write this equation as, like that. Okay, for the force of kinetic friction, on the other hand, comma, the force of kinetic 
Subscription has a single value. A single value. But a similar equation. A similar equation if compares the maximum value of static friction, okay? The force of kinetic friction is going to be mu sub s, mu sub k, times the normal. In general, In general, mu sub k, let's see here, I'm going to get that. I'm going to use this equation here. No, I'm going to use this one here. In general, in general, you go. Mu sub s is going to be equal, greater or equal than mu sub k. As before, you know, mu sub k depends on the surfaces that are in contact with one another. Uh, let's see, 645, let me show you some values of the force of static and kinetic friction. You can go here in the internet, Google. Okay, force of kinetic friction. Uh, coefficient. Those things are, are measured in the laboratory. Coefficient of friction for different surfaces. Let's see, science correct. Okay, here you go. Hard steel on hard steel. Static friction is 0.78. Greasy, 0.11. Uh, sliding. This slider would be the kinetic one, but that we are talking about dry, right? We didn't say what's the value of the sliding friction for a greasy substance, but that's just for the steel. Let me see. Coefficients, we have more. Okay. Aluminum to aluminum. Okay. Static varies from 1.1 to 1.35. Uh, what about that stuff here? Here you go. Yeah, it's uh, lubricated. Uh, what is kinetic? Dry con. That, that, this, one, this one must be the kinetic. Uh, let me see if I can find another. Let's see, what time is that? Almost there, right? Three more minutes. Give me three more minutes, please. Uh, coefficient of friction of Teflon. Teflon is a very interesting material. Okay, let's go to Wikipedia. See here, coefficient of kinetic friction. You can also look in the book. Okay, here you go. Static friction, kinetic friction. Aluminum is still 0.61, 0 0.47. Aluminum, aluminum, 1.05. It varies. For some reason that I shouldn't understand, you know, the coefficient of kinetic friction here is more. Okay, so there must be there might be some some you know. But wait a minute. But this, yeah, that's right. See that? For some reason here that that's the you know just, just I, I never I don't know if it's a mistake in Wikipedia or if it is a a you know something real okay uh, we have also for others now let's see concrete and rubber here you go concrete and rubber that that's applicable to to your car right here you go 1.0 dry and clean 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.85 dry and clean for kinetic okay concrete rubber and then we have asphalt let me see if i have asphalt here i don't think we have asphalt asphalt nope okay we have wood uh wooden metal yeah we have those values here that uh, that is more is interesting I, I cannot explain why they did oh that's because they have a range of values wooden metal okay here is much lower than the other, and so on. Okay, Teflon. Teflon has a very low coefficient. Oh, this is one of the materials that has the lowest coefficient of friction. Okay, ice on steel has a very low coefficient of friction. See that? 
I think if we have synovial joints. Ah, okay, human synovial joints. 0 0.01. Okay? And again, for some reason, the, the static friction is lower. Oh, no, no. Kinetic friction is less. Okay, here you go. 0 0.01, 0 0.003. Synovial joint is the, is the fluid. Synovial fluid, okay, is the, is the fluid in our joints. Okay, so we can stop now. 650 and we can meet again there upstairs.